The great John Nash sadly passed away after a car accident and I thought I would take uh, this occasion to pay tribute to his beautiful mind. Uh, so you might know him because uh, he was uh, the, the character of uh, the movie A Beautiful Mind uh, with uh, Russell Crowe. Uh, and in this movie uh, they particularly insisted on a big part of John Nash's life which is his schizophrenia. Uh, so it was a genetic schizophrenia that uh, would later affect his son as well. And um, he would be delusional during this phase that was between the 60s, uh, 70s, 80s as well, uh, where he was um, so uh, starting from his 30s. must have been particularly frustrating for him because this should have been the, the highlight the, of his career. And, it's, um, and as a mathematician, you have to wonder what he might have achieved if he had uh, had these years to spend uh, doing mathematics. But he already had done a lot of amazing mathematics before he suffered from schizophrenia. So most famously, his most uh, important uh, piece of work, his most cited piece of work, is his concept of Nash equilibrium uh, for game theory. So back then, uh, in the late 1940s, just after the war, uh, game theory became a very popular topic. Uh, and that's because John von Neumann, uh, who was a really the big guy back then, he was like, for me, he's like the greatest applied mathematician of all time. He had written a book in the late, in 1944, with Oskar Morgenstern about uh, game theory, where he introduced this idea of what happens when two rational engines interact uh, uh, intelligently uh, in a game uh, and this became very popular and one of the great contributions of John Nash to this field is to generalize the ideas of von Neumann. So von Neumann's setting was really limited to two player zero-sum games which means that these are games where there is going to be a winner and a loser. So, for instance, in chess, there's a winner and a loser. Okay? And von Neumann only considered this setting. He, well, he considered a little bit other than this setting, but not much more. And Nash's amazing insight was to generalize this idea and to realize that in real life there are many interactions uh, between many interactions between strategic agents. Uh, which are not true players and which are not zero-sum. Okay, so sometimes you, you want, you're going to want to collaborate with someone and you can then both win or if you don't collaborate, you can both lose. So, it was, so in the movie of Beautiful Mind, they, they presented that as an alternative to Adam Smith's uh, invisible hand way of thinking, where the sort of the, the ideology is that the incentives of the individuals will always, in a free market, line up so that they sort of maximize social welfare. They sort of work out for the best for the whole of society. And the amazing insight of, of uh, Nash was to realize that this was not the case. The way it's told today is through the analogy of the tragedy of the commons. So the tragedy of the commons is the idea that, for instance, if everyone has to pitch in to build a road, then individually, each individual does not have incentive to pitch in because the road is going to be built anyways. But then if no one pitches in, if everyone follows his individual incentives, then the, the road will not be built and everybody will be left out worse than if he had followed what was the collective incentives. So basically Nash key idea, key, um, Nash key insight was to see that incentives were not always aligned and instead when people follow individual incentives uh, they're going to have to a certain interaction that would lead them to some equilibrium and this equilibrium is now, is now called the Nash equilibrium is the, the equilibrium uh, John Nash came up with in his thesis. 
and by the way, before he suffered from schizophrenia, uh, he seemed to be the guy, uh, he didn't seem to be uh, an autistic guy, even quite the opposite, I would say. He seemed to be the kind of very confident, self-confident and imposing, charismatic uh, kind of guy. So a lot of what I'm saying is based on the book uh, A Beautiful Mind by Sylvia Nazar, uh, which is a biography of John Nash, a brilliant biography which I strongly uh, recommend. And uh, in this book, uh, Sylvia Nazar depicts a man who's really charismatic, that people will want to follow his life until his 30s was basically a series of amazing achievements. So, sort of naturally, uh, he had a very really high opinion of himself, and this led him to be a bit arrogant. And um, so I'm not sure it's a sign of arrogance, but he was um, so confident in his uh, theory of games that he actually dared to take uh, a meeting with uh, John von Neumann, which is something that even professors did not really dare to do unless you have something very promising, something really important to, to tell von Neumann. Otherwise, it was very, like, you had to be bold to, to disturb von Neumann, and for sure students would not dare to disturb the great John von Neumann. But Nash did. Nash uh, knocked on von Neumann's door and he had, he explained to, to von Neumann his ideas of, of games. Now I'm going to guess here that he was extremely self-confident and, um, and maybe a bit arrogant in this meeting. And anyways, uh, at some point uh, Nash, uh, von Neumann told Nash, probably because he was upset with him, that's trivial. Everything you've done is just trivial. Trivial means easy in mathematical terms. It's just a fixed point theorem, uh, which it is, but the amazing thing about uh, the concept of Nash equilibrium and the theory of games by, by John Nash was not that much of the mathematics. The mathematics is quite straightforward. The proof of the theorem is less than a page. The beauty of that is not in the mathematics of the result, but in the construction on the, the model, in the, the way of thinking about games. And this has really revolutionized uh, mostly economics, but also uh, biology. It has had amazing applications to, to biology that Nash probably didn't foresee. Uh, and today, if you're doing mathematical evolutionary biology, you definitely dealing with concepts like Nash equilibrium. Now, it's always interesting to ask what is the impact of mathematician to, on society? And this is usually a very difficult answer, and it, I think, really is in the case of uh, Nash's contribution to game theory, which is, I think, the contribution that he made that has had the most impact on, on, on society. Uh, and I would say that the impact of game theory is huge, like very, very huge. Um, and I'm going to defend this point by uh, telling you about this book. Uh, this is a, a book written by Bruce Bueno de Mesquita, who is a professor of geopolitics uh, at NYU, uh, New York University, and uh, Stanford. And um, and so Mesquita, over the, the last 30, 40 years, uh, he, his job, uh, he was employed by the NSA or this, and the CIA, or maybe both, I don't remember, to make predictions about politics. And the amazing thing is that Mesquita's predictions were based on mathematical models. You just input data into the models. Then you had to crunch the numbers using a computer because the computations are too hard to be handled by hand. And then out of the computer comes a prediction. And these predictions turned out to be more reliable, much more, significantly more reliable than the opinions of the experts. And usually, and not usually, but a lot of the time, they would actually contradict the opinions of the experts, and that's very interesting. So there's a story like early on in this book where Mesquita uh, was having a model about 
uh, Indian election and and he inputs the data. Now he had an idea of who might win the election. It was like the favorite. There was one favorite candidate, and well, Mesquita thought that this favorite candidate uh, would win the election and would be the one that was predicted by his model. But it turns out it wasn't. And amazingly, he trusted his model over his intuition, and his model turned out to be right. Um, and this way it tells you the, the power of game theory. Now I would recommend this book not because of the predictions that he, it makes. These are very interesting. But what's even more interesting to me in this book is the way game theory helps you have an insight, uh, an understanding that's very counterintuitive of how, of how things really work out in geopolitics, in human decision making. Uh, and that, I think, is very, very important and it's something like a lot of these ideas are ideas that I actually had before reading this book, but I had them basically because I had this game theoretical training in my background. And, uh, and I do think that, and I'm pr pretty convinced, and I, I was already convinced before reading this book that the insights of game theory were extremely helpful in understanding how things work in politics. And it's a shame that a lot of news and, and politic analysis do not include the idea of game theory. Most importantly, the idea of incentives. Uh, really, uh, basically, the, the key message of game theory is that yeah, incentives are, are what drives people. Like You have to think in terms of incentives, incentives, and incentives. Um, now, I'm not saying that all news or all political shows do not include this part, but those that do are usually the good ones. <laughs> That's what I would say. So, so after Nash walked out uh, von Neumann's office, he was still like he, he he understood that he needed to make more significant mathematics to get recognition from his peers. But his uh, advisor, Albert Tucker, who's a very famous among the mathematicians. So, uh, especially applied mathematicians and stuff like optimization and, and game theory. Uh, well, his supervisor Tucker told him, yeah, okay, you, do sh you could do something else, but you already have something very interesting. Let's just publish that. And so Nash wrote his thesis on that. And it's a 28-page thesis, which is extremely short for a thesis. I don't think today there's any thesis that is that short. And probably more surprisingly, the thesis only has two uh, references. One is uh, von Neumann's uh, book with uh, Morgenstern uh, uh, on the foundations uh, of game theory. And the other reference was an article that Nash had already written. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, his thesis, only two references. Like today, there would be, like, I don't think there's any university in the world that would dare to give a, a PhD for, for a thesis that only has two references, no matter how good the thesis is. Now, after he got his PhD, uh, Nash went to work to the RAND Corporation, which is a top security, top secret security uh, agency uh, that deals with codes. And it was really a very mathematical environment. Uh, so it was still the Cold War back then. and. Well, mathematics was really crucial to the development of, of, of defense and especially everything that has to do with uh, surveillance and uh, encryptions and communication, secret communication and stuff like that. And Nash was part of this team, uh, of the RAND team. Uh, he also made some amazingly insightful uh, remarks about cryptography. In particular, basically, he stated informally in a letter to the, to the, to the NSA, uh, what is now one of the most important problems in mathematics, uh, one of the seven million problems in mathematics, which is the P versus NP problem. Um, not going to go into the details, but basically, Nash figured out that this game that was played between uh, uh, cryptographers and code breakers was really a game that there had to be a winner too, theoretically, or based on theoretical reasoning. And he figured out that if, and if he, he figured out that the winner 
of this game could be fully determined by the solution of a very abstract mathematical problem, uh, which is the P versus NP problem. Uh, and this prediction that he made uh, was 20 years before the P versus NP problem was finally discovered or, or formalized by all the mathematicians. Uh, when I say discovered, I don't mean proved. I just mean that, you know, before proving a theorem, there's always a first step, which is guessing what the theorem could be, what, what it is that we should prove. And, uh, and this part is usually even more interesting uh, than the trying to prove the theorem part. And, and yeah, so the, the idea of computational hardness was, was invented by, by John Nash basically back then. But he ran into trouble in, uh, when he was working in RAND, in the, in the RAND Corporation. Uh, and that's because uh, he, he, had, uh, well, he, he had homosexual adventures back then. And he was caught in one of them. I don't know if it was actually uh, legal, but... It was definitely frowned upon, and, and for sure, like, just like Turing, Nash uh, suffered from it and was, uh, he was fired, basically, from the Rand Corporation for having been caught in a homosexual uh, adventure. And then he got a, a position at MIT. So when he arrived at MIT, he was like, he was like a very handsome, uh, brilliant, uh, successful uh, mathematician. And he started to, to see a nurse, uh, Eleanor Steyer. And they actually had a child together. And Nash had a very, somehow a bit disrespectful relationship with her. Basically, he regarded her as not worth, totally worthy of him because she was only a nurse and he was like this big superstar in mathematics. And she always believed that in the, at the end of the road like she would end up with him, like they were going to marry and all. But he never promised uh, such a thing. And even once the, the, the son was born, Nash still uh, hung out with her, but he, he never proposed to her, he never married her. Nash thought that Harvard was much better than MIT and that Harvard was where he should have been appointed at. That may be one of the reasons why he really looked down he, on his colleagues at MIT. He really, he was probably very arrogant with them, considering that he was beyond that. And so there's a famous story uh, according to which he was very arrogant to his colleague his office mate, something like that, uh, Ambrose Warren. And Ambrose Warren then challenged him with a problem. And instead of solving this problem, Nash went around the offices of MIT just telling people that he had solved this problem just to see the, pe the, the reactions of the people. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything about that because I already made a video about this, this problem. It's called the embedding problem. Uh, an isometric embedding problem for, for the mathematics editions among you. Uh, and uh, he cracked it. It was unbelievable uh, that he, had, he cracked this uh, problem, which was very, a very, very difficult problem. Uh, well, it was a 100 year old problem. It was also a crucial problem, like uh, in the development of geometry, like it was such a basic problem. It had to have a solution, and the one who gave it is, is John Nash. Okay, so, so that was in the, the 1950s. Uh, now in 1956, a little bit after that, uh, well, he, he was invited at the Courant Institute of, uh, of Mathematical Sciences at uh, New York University. And there, a mathematician named uh, Nirenberg gave him uh, an interesting problem to work on on partial differential equations, which was a very difficult problem. Uh, basically, partial differential equations are a bunch of very, very difficult problems. So the problem I'm talking about is um, some nonlinear parabolic partial differential equations, and something, and you had to prove the, the existence and regularity of solutions. And uh, this was a very, very difficult problem. And what's amusing about this is that Nash so see, he came there and he knew nothing about, well, 
probably he knew more than I do. I don't know a lot about partial differential equations, but he, he, he didn't know much, probably not much more than I do right now. And, and he was invited there to, to try to solve this problem. And so he would see a lot of Nirenberg basically every day asking him questions. And Nirenberg was struck by the stupidity of Nash's question. Nash was basically a, a huge amateur on this kind of question. And you would expect him to give up after a while. Basically, every day he would come to Nuremberg's office and ask him something. And Nuremberg was like, no, come on, man. This, this, is, this makes no sense what you're doing. It's just stupid. But Nash persevered. Nash just tried again and again and again. And this is really one of the, the, the most amazing aspects of, of Nash's way of thinking. He, he wanted to prove everything. He wanted to do everything by himself. And so, so of course, when you're doing research, you, you, you have to do things by yourself because no one has done it before. But even when he was a student, he, he would prove a lot of things that, whose proofs are already known. Uh, and in that, uh, in that aspect, he's a lot like a lot of other very, very like, top mathematicians like Grothendieck or, or, or Poincaré. And I guess it's the right way of getting very, of doing interest in mathematics. When you're learning mathematics, you don't have the same approach to mathematics as when you're really doing mathematics. Um, I think it should teach us a, a lot about how mathematics should be learned. Uh, maybe it should not be learned as a sequence of proof that you need to learn and memorize and learn techniques from, but there must be more of this problem-solving aspect of mathematics that needs to be maybe developed in, uh, in our math education system. Uh, in any case, after two years of working on this problem, Nash came up with questions that were more and more and more relevant. And at some point, he became the world leader in, uh, in uh, partial dif differential equation studies, uh, to the point where he actually organized uh, a, a solution. By organized, I mean he really orchestrated the thing. He gave his colleagues small problems to work on, and only he actually had the full vision of what was going on. And, he, and, and by doing that, he managed to crack this problem. Unfortunately for him, he cracked it just a year after uh, some Italian uh, mathematician, uh, Di Giorgi, cracked it. Uh, and so he did not have the full recognition for his work that he wanted to have. And he was actually very pissed about that. And I, I guess it can be very frustrating for, for, for someone like him to, who's really in search of mathematical recognition all his life. And, and, um, and so later on in 1958, uh, Fields medals were given and he did not win a Fields medal. Uh, and Nash was very upset about not winning a Fields medal. The Fields medal is the highest honor in mathematics, it's the equivalent of a Nobel Prize uh, because there's no Nobel Prize in mathematics. And it's like the, the, the greatest recognition a, a mathematician can have. And he did not win it and he was very upset about it. And when you think about it, it's, he's just too much in a hurry. He was just too much in a hurry because he was still 30 year old back then and the the rule for the for the Fields Medal is it's given until you're 40. So you, like, maybe someone who's in the 30s, you're not going to give it to him right now, but he's going to win it like four years later or maybe eight years later. And Nash, unfortunately, did not win later on because in the late 50s, he started to suffer from schizophrenia. Um, so in the late 1950s, he got his wife uh, Alicia Lopez Harrison Delarde uh, pregnant. But while his wife was pregnant, he started to suffer from schizophrenia. He started to have delusions and to the point where he seemed dangerous. 
So Alicia decided to put him in a psychiatric uh, hospital uh, for treatment for schizophrenia and he really didn't like it. He, he didn't really realize how, how much he suffered from these delusions and, and he tried to, to escape. He didn't trust her anymore. And, uh, this one was probably very hard. And then he was uh, in a on and off kind of situation. Um, sometimes he felt better and he, he went to work uh, at MIT. And other times he was put back uh, in uh, in hospital by Alicia usually, and it was a very tough situation. And the, uh, he he uh, at some point also he made a trip to Europe with Alicia. Uh, so, so one one of the things he tried to do uh, uh, in this trip was to give away his passport. He tried to become stateless. Uh, that was not so weird actually back then. It was a uh, movement, especially among uh, intellectuals, to abolish nationalism, basically. He really admired, for instance, uh, Alexander Gothendieck, who would be stateless for his whole life. And Gothendieck was living in Paris, so, so he actually flew to Paris to meet him. And then he would try to, he, he tried to give away his passport uh, in France, but the French government didn't want. So then he flew to, he went to Switzerland to do so, but then like the Swiss didn't accept that and eventually he, he didn't and he, he went back to, to the US where he, he suffered again from schizophrenia and um, was set again in, a, was put again in a, in hospital. And so as opposed to what's told in the movie, Nash and, uh, Alicia, and Alicia uh, divorced uh, in 1963. And even though they were no longer married, uh, Alicia Delarde still took care of him. And then in the 1960s, he would spend a lot of time in, in hospitals, um, getting treatment for his schizophrenia, but it wouldn't work. And, and then in the 70s, he moved back to Princeton and have uh, a ghostly presence in the library uh, of Princeton, where he would just wander around. Uh, at some point he stopped uh, medication. And, and then, miracle, in the late 80s, Nash started to, to feel much better to, to make sense of the world again. And even his, he even started to do mathematics and he would just uh, audit in the classrooms uh, at Princeton and eventually even took classes and taught and he did really and he even started to do some good mathematics afterwards and and, and so in the early 90s he started to feel much better and was then given his Nobel Prize. He resumed his relationship also with Alicia Delarde in, uh, and they remarried in, in 2001. Uh, his last interests were apparently in number theory and uh, in the study of general relativity. Unfortunately, he didn't make as great contributions in those fields, in those, in those fields as he did in, in other fields when he was young. So a few days ago, sadly, Nash died. He was 86 years old, and he's definitely lived a, an amazing and difficult life. He was at the top in his youth, possibly the greatest mathematician back then. He conquered fields after fields in a very amazing way. He worked on game theory, revolutionized game theory. He worked on geometry, revolutionized geometry. He worked on partial differential equations and revolutionized partial differential equations, to the point where he was really the leader in all of these fields when he was working on them. And then he faced his demons almost literally, and he survived from the dead almost literally, recovered from that and became a great mathematician again. He definitely is a beautiful mind that we should all greet and hail and praise.